So welcome to this month's The Contact Centre Network, where we're talking about how we manage to bridge the divide between management and leadership. And I think what's really great about today's session um, is we've got somebody from the operation who has a lived experience um, across um, a number of years, Jane. So you've got plenty of experience across different roles and different um, experiences of leadership. So Jane's going to be able to share some really um, good examples of, of her journey um, through the contact center and through the different um, leadership uh, roles that she's taken. But we're going to do that in a very facilitated way. I'm going to ask um, Jane some questions, as we always do. But what I want to do for, for this session is if anybody has any questions or any thoughts and reflections as we go through the session, drop them into the chat. Um, it'll be really great to have some really thought-provoking questions for Jane about her journey through leadership, about maybe some of the struggles that you're having with your existing team, if there are, if there are ways that we can help kind of um, give you some opportunities to kind of pick people's brains and share experience, this is a great forum to do that. And obviously, it's a, it's a very safe environment to ask a, a question. And we'll just pull those out as we go through um, the session today. And we'll stay in, spend some time a little bit at the end, um, just kind of doing a little bit of a Q&A for either myself, for Jane, or if there is anybody on the panel that has a point of view um, that wants to kind of um, put anything out there in terms of their experiences, this is a really great and open forum to do that. And what's great about this, this type of webinar is we, we give people an opportunity to kind of take themselves off mute, ask questions, or share their experiences, which you don't get in some other webinars. So we like to keep it a little bit interactive um, so that people can bring what's, what their burning platforms are to this as, um, as, a, as, a, as a forum. So, Jane, welcome to the Contact Centre Network. Thank you, Gary. Lovely to be here. Lovely to have you. And for those that don't know, Jane is a, is a former colleague of mine from, my, um, from many years ago now, which, uh, which nearly four years ago from when I was in the land of PAYE uh, and working for Booper Healthcare. So Jane heads up yeah, the uh, consumer retention team. But I'm not going to steal your thunder, Jane, in terms of your intro. And I'm going to just hand over to you to give yourself a little bit of an intro and a little bit of a summary about, um, I suppose, your experience in, in leadership. So who you are, where you've come from and what your experience is, Jane. Over to you. Thank you. Um, so delighted to be here. Um, delighted to have been asked. And uh, as Gary said, we uh, we go way back. I used to call Gary my work husband um, because we were like partners in crime kind of uh, at, at Booper, which was great. Um, so I've worked at Booper for 25 years um, and for most of that time I've been a, in a, a leadership role. Um, never ever thought that I would uh, sort of spend that time at one company. That was never my intention when I joined. Um, but love the job that I do, uh, love the people that I work with, love the type of work that I do. Um, and actually kind of now I think, well, you know, what, why would I swap that and, and go kind of anywhere else? So um, I've been a leader at Booper for most of that time. So um, joined as like a lot of people were in contact centers. So on the phones um, in our um, service team, knew when I joined that I wanted to be a team manager, just kind of felt that I could do the job, um, knew it was for me, I was quite, um, quite ambitious, quite competitive as a sort of a frontline um, sort of person. Loved the job that I did, loved talking to customers, got a really good experience of what it was like to actually be on the front line. Um, so I became a team manager and then f followed quite a traditional path. So I then became an operations manager um, when the operations manager took some mat leave um, and worked in lots of different roles. So worked on transformation programs, um, always in a, the insurance business and always working really closely with our customers and our sort of customer contact centers. Um, landed in the role that I'm in now, um, probably around about 10 years ago. So I head up our consumer retention team. So, um, and we're a team of around about 120 people. Um, so that's kind of the, the size of the contact center that I, uh, that I look after. Not, not one of the biggest contact centers in Bupa, but definitely one of the biggest in terms of in our commercial um, kind of teams. We're considered part of the, the sales team. Um, and I was chatting to Gary about this sort of um, topic before Christmas really, and particularly around how companies and organizations in my opinion, could be better at supporting people when they're making that transition through the leadership ranks. And when I say that, I, I mean all the way kind of through, if you like. And, you know, for me, I started as a frontline um, 
you know, sort of frontline colleague, moved into a team manager role. Um, and I remember at that time, there wasn't a great deal of um, training, there wasn't really a great deal of support. Um, and really, it was kind of one day you're on the phones talking to the customers, the next day you're actually then managing a team and, and you're you know just sitting in a different seat with different expectations. Um, and I think actually that goes all the way up. So um, I was explaining to Gary that quite recently we had a reorg at work and I landed in a, a different team. So I didn't get promotion. My job, job didn't change, was doing the same role. But what changed was the environment around me and the team that I became part of. And I actually moved into a much more um, senior team, um, a more senior um, leader. So I moved into the um, sort of general um, general managers uh, kind of role. So one removed from our kind of CEO um, and actually was operating a team that was thinking much more strategically, um, a team of men. So suddenly I was in a, a, a team of um, a team of men that were very strategic and blue thinkers. Um, and that was something that was really new, new for me. And um, and again, there wasn't there wasn't a a support or there wasn't that that need in terms of how that might feel for me and that change. There there wasn't anything sort of put put around me. And you could argue actually as a senior leader, it's just sort of suck that up and get on with it. But um, I really sort of experienced this kind of feeling of I'm not entirely sure whether I'm where whether I'm supposed to be in here. You know what, what my role is. And and as I say, my role didn't change. Didn't get promotion. People were actually emailing me saying congratulations on your new role. You know you got a promotion. I was like, well, I haven't. I'm just in a more senior team. And the expect expectations change. So when I think of you know I moved into a team manager's role that was 23 years ago. And I look now still at how we're supporting that, that first step into a, a kind of managers into a leadership role. And I still think we've got work to do. Um, I still see and hear people being surprised when they step into those roles at the amount of work that they have to do. Um, they don't even know how to manage their own time coming from frontline contact centre roles into suddenly you're managing a team and your time is your own. And, you know, you've got to fill that time up and, and think about it. So. I think it's not just kind of one level, it's all levels and, and really wrapping our arms about around people and taking the time to actually support and understand what's what's going on, if you like. I think you've made a, a really good point there, Jane, because I think when we talk about leadership development, we often think about that from maybe agent moving into team leader role rather than a team leader moving into maybe a middle manager role or a middle manager role moving into a more senior role. And there, there is almost an expectation that once you've achieved management status, that the role that you're then applying for in the next level, you are already almost pre-qualified once you get the role, if you're lucky enough to get the role. And I think what that breeds is almost that self-doubt, imposter syndrome, that lack of confidence. So Thinking about your lived experience, Jane, and, and so the examples that you've taken your team through, how would you say we bridge the competency gaps for managers in those scenarios and maybe some of the intended consequences when we don't get that right? Yeah, so I think, um, I mean, for me, I, I think the starting point has to be the conversation in terms of um, kind of expectations when when people are moving into into roles and again I think um, that those conversations can be missed to your point there's that expectation that suddenly you kind of know what you're doing so I think it, it, it starts with that and it starts with being really clear in terms of those expectations so for me when I um, when I sort of have anybody joining my team the first conversation is um, around about those uh, objective setting, you know, so so what is the role? What are the objectives? And we've all got job descriptions, right? And we've all got what we think the role is. But I think actually that clarity in terms of what that really is and what you're being expected to deliver is really important. Um, I've had people join my team that are already doing the role. And again, probably through reorgs more than anything. And at Boopa, we do a lot of that. Um, but people have appeared in my team that are working in a, in a position that, as Gary says, actually, you, you know, really expect them to already know what they're doing. But moving into a, a different leader changes the expectation. So not all leaders have the same expectations. It might be that you've raised the bar. It might be that you work differently. So I think that contracting bit at the start in terms of 
this is what I expect, this is what I think you're on the hook for, do you agree or actually do you expect something different? Good point. Um, and I, I I really like using that with my team, even, even actually not people that are new to the team, but I think as a way of working with any member of the team, regularly reviewing objectives, um, we use um, objectives and, and sort of key indicators. So what's the thing you're delivering? Uh, what are some of the tasks that sit beneath that? And, and I'll use those as my regular sort of monthly one-to-ones to actually check progress in terms of some of those big kind of ticket items. Not necessarily the BAU. So when we think about the BAU, which is about delivering operational excellence, delivering your QA outcomes, delivering your sort of people scores, but actually some of those more maybe those big ticket items that are going to move your business forward and transform your business. So you might be working on new call scripts, as an example, you might be developing a new capability program. So, so whatever the things are, but really kind of calling those out and measuring progress on them. So I think that that for me is probably the, the key thing is that actually everybody's really clear on this is what I'm responsible for. This is what you expect of me. And I, I think, um, one of the things that I've learned um, sort of through my career is actually making sure that you know from your boss what they expect, you know, so I'm joining your team, you know, how do you like to work? What do you expect? Um, what can I deliver and what can I do that will make your job as easy as possible and our relationship as good as possible? And that really early on conversation in terms of what good looks like, I think really sort of sets the foundations and the, the kind of um, sets your stall out in terms of delivery. I think you through that conversation. Sorry, go on, oh, so, No, go on, Jay. I was just going to say, I think through that conversation, I think what that then draws out or should draw out some of those skills gaps or those competency gaps. Because actually, if, if you're then through that conversation being asked to deliver something that you really don't know how to or you haven't done before, again, I think it's um, being brave enough to call that out. And, and you know, I think I, I may be haven't always been brave enough because to the point once you're in a leadership role or a manager's role um you kind of feel like you should know it all anyway um so there is a bit about you know being brave enough to say well you've asked me to do that but I'm not familiar can you tell me can you show me have you got examples Um, and some of the things that spring to mind with me are things like I know the first time you write a business case as an example you know so you just pull together a business case for that thing you're doing it's like, oh, uh, okay. Uh, yes, um, can. Um, Google. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You know, so um, I think just being really clear on and and being really brave because there's nothing worse than I think as a as a leader expecting your team to deliver something that you think they know how to do and then yeah. they, and then they don't. So um, I think that's really important. And I, I think you, we we have lots of programs, don't we, for um, aspiring new managers or managers new to role and we we kind of build some of these things with uh with with the best intentions um and try and encourage people to go on them but what we don't necessarily build um is that nurturing program for for leaders and and managers managing in management it, it, and those types of programs so and and if you think about that from um, an l and d perspective um certainly when you become more senior um, in the contact center and you move into different management roles, there is an expectation that you'll go and find um, your own way. But what's the role, would you say, of learning and development in supporting managers on their management journey? Mm, I, I would, do you know what? I think that's a really good sort of question. Um, it'd be great to hear from uh, others that you've got on the call in terms of how their organizations, um, mm. I guess, if we've got interact with LND. LND. Here, yeah. Would be interesting. Yeah. 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 So, um, I mean, I can talk about my experience. And, and again, mine is very um, sort of booper focused. I've been there for 25 years. So, I'm not an expert in how all organizations kind of do this. So, um, I would say we are, um, I, th- I would say we're, we're quite poor at um, booper in terms of leadership and management development. Um, we have the um, sort of initial management programs which enable you to complete your TNC framework as an example. So yeah. a bit to your bit to your point, you need to be signed off and competent as a manager. Managers need to be observed. And we've got that box, um, I guess, firmly ticked in terms of that as a requirement that we need to satisfy ourselves. I think once you move above kind of a team lead role, it then becomes a bit more sketchy and a bit more, a bit more flaky. Um, we do have apprenticeships and we have access to apprenticeships. I think they're great. Um, but I also think I see 
I see people go through apprenticeships who really enjoy the experience. They get lots from it, but they then get to the end of it and don't have the opportunity to apply the skills that they've actually uh, actually learned. And if they are applying the skills that they learn, what they don't have is anybody who's observing them applying those skills that they've learned that can say that they've learned them and that have kind of grasped the concept or they're using them them yeah. well. So I think apprenticeships are absolutely great. I just um, I just think, again, they need to not stop at the end of the year or the 18 months. And yeah. there's more to kind of embed embed that. Um I think I would love and I think it would be amazing if the if our L&D colleagues had a, um, a set of management development modules that you could access that you could pull off the shelf. Um, you know, I'll use an example, strategic thinking. Right. So, again, mm -hmm. the more senior you get, the more it's kind of you need to think strategically and, you know, what's the longer term vision and. You know, and if you're somebody who's worked in a contact centre and worked your way out through a contact centre, generally don't think that strategically because what you're doing is you're dealing with what's in front of you kind of at, at, at that time. So whether that's high call queues, whether that's QA yeah. that's not not kind of delivering what you need or your kind of NPS scores. So I've always found contact centres quite reactive um, and therefore that ability to think more strategically, um, you know, kind of suddenly kind of makes yeah. you, oh, what, what does that mean? How do I even do that? So, so I think, yeah, a set of modules that kind of go, actually, these are the things that as a more senior leader, you are required to do differently would be great, right? If you could just yeah. kind of pull those off the shelf and, um, and put, put them, put yourself through them and actually put yourself through them before you become a senior leader so that when you do step into that role yep. you've already kind of started that kind of education and that training which then yeah. equips you and puts you in a stronger position um and i know i've definitely you know particularly in the last year as part of the restructure that i was part of found myself in a team where we were defining the strategy and creating the strategy and, and i was like oh okay I, you know this I've, I've got to do some new stuff now and mm. you know who, who's who's good at that and who can actually do that and help me um but again, that kind of, you know, is are there some yeah. um, techniques and some sort of programs that that kind of immerse you in that would be yeah. sort of really helpful. And um, I, I think you you've you've hit the the nail on the head there is to say right, actually, when we move into either new to management roles or more senior roles, there isn't necessarily that access to knowledge and access to people who have that ability to impart that knowledge and who've got that expertise in strategic thinking, in customer experience, in marketing. So how do we get better at signposting internally to the people who hold that knowledge? And, and maybe how, how have you approached it in, in your role as a leader to make sure that the people who need to do the job that they're doing have access to the right people around them? Yeah, so I think that's a really good question. Um, I don't think we've got this right yet. It, it, and um, I think there's definitely more that we could do. Some of the things that I see work um, are mentor programs. So we've got some really great mentor programs. Um, I was on one last year, actually, and was matched with a colleague who works in our uh, one of our hospitals, also somebody who works in our Bupa Global office and, and looks after customers who are based in sort of Egypt, Latin, Latin America and um, you know, sort of looks after our providers. So I think formal mentor, mentor programs are a great way of um, of kind of connecting with people who might have the skills that you're lacking and, and that you're missing. Yeah. Um, I also think um, kind of informal networks. So we were talking at the start of the, the call, and this is a, a gap that I've kind of um, tried to bridge internally. So I um, I'm part of a, a women's network at Bupa, so um, and we've recently set up a women's network where we actually are empowering women in the workplace who might lack confidence, might struggle with imposter syndrome, might work with difficult people. Um, and our women, our women's network, they come together. We come together once a month, and we've also got a, a kind of Teams channel where we talk and share things. But really, it's a safe space where we come together where we can talk conf confidently to each other and say out loud that when we're not feeling particularly confident, which can be quite hard to do. Mm. Um, and I say and I say it's a women's network, um, which it is, but we also have male sponsors and male allies within that network yeah. that actually champion and support us as a group of women that mm. are wanting to make a difference in the workplace. Um, so I think those informal networks are, are a great way of... Um, 
bridging some of that, not necessarily the skills gap, but definitely those feelings of um, it's like sharing, in, sharing a common ground and, and sharing journeys and experiences, isn't it? And, and we, we talked about in the in the preparations that it's it's OK for leaders to show vulnerability. Um, would, would you would you agree with that statement and, and what are your thoughts on leaders as a population being comfortable showing their vulnerability? Yeah, I, you know, I mean, I, I see myself as quite an authentic leader. Um, I, Gary, you know, we've worked together for a long time and I sort of, I love people. I'm interested in people. I'm curious in people mm. and, and, you know, in the, in the right job, right? Because yeah. I meet new people all the time and, and they're interested in them. Um, I think actually being able to stand up and say, um, you know, sometimes I don't know what I'm doing. Sometimes yeah. I'm going to need some help. Sometimes I don't wake up in the morning and jump out of bed and go whoopee I'm having a fabulous day and I you can't I do that every day <laughs> yeah yeah wouldn't that be amazing um but I think yeah being being your authentic self and um you know that that and, and for me yes sharing vulnerability I would say yes it's a it's a great skill yeah. to be able to have as a leader but I think also that authenticity piece plays into that as well you need to be authentic with that um, and people will see through you if you're being vulnerable for yeah. the sake of being vulnerable because you feel that it's the right thing to do. Yeah. And we all, though, all know those leaders that have, um, you know, that we've worked with that have been in courses and then they come out and they do things that you just think that's a bit odd and it doesn't quite sit right. <laughs> so I think it's about finding your true leadership style yeah. and being yourself. Um, and and yeah, I mean. It's, it's interesting actually I so my my new boss um is you know one of the ways he's sort of got to know us and his team is he, he he's he really kind of shares sort of quite a lot about his personal life and 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 actually it's really nice to hear he's a person mm. he's married he's got children he has the same struggles that all of us do and you know it, it isn't about I come into work and I need to be somebody different because we've all got that that stuff going yeah. on at, at home right and that makes it difficult to always be our best inside of work and I think you know if we adopt an attitude um of everybody's doing their best and that's our starting point then actually it becomes much easier and a much nicer place to be kind of yeah. in the workplace um you, and you, you've talked about authentic leadership there and and you are talking very authentically so you're you're that's kind of oozing out of you now so thank you very much for being so candid and honest and you you've also talked about perhaps suffering from that kind of in, imposter syndrome um situation and i i think sometimes that can be more true when you've worked internally certainly i, I know i've experienced it in my career going through an internal promotion. Do you think imposter syndrome as, a, as, a, as something that affects managers on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis is something mm. that can be overcome? And, and, and what are the, the kind of the, the techniques that you use to kind of just remind yourself that you've earned the right to be at that table? Yeah. So um, I don't know if anybody saw, there was a really good LinkedIn post from Stephen Bartlett um, about reframing imposter syndrome I loved it I shared it uh, so if you're on LinkedIn and, and you you know have a look and you can see kind of that I posted it but he talks about the fact that he sits in Dragon's Den and he looks to the left of him and there's Peter Jones and he looks to the right and there's Deborah Medium. I don't know if anybody watches Dragon's Den and he just looks at himself and he goes what am I doing here <laughs> um, you know has watched Dragon's Den since the age of 12 and suddenly he's kind of in there and he talks about actually reframing imposter syndrome and it being an opportunity to grow this is a growth this is a growth moment right I loved that I only saw it last night I'm like Do you know what I'm taking that yeah. um but I think you know for, for me um imposter syndrome sort of probably crept in in my 30s um so prior to working at Bupa I mean, it might be helpful to know but prior to working at Bupa um I lived out in the sort of Canary Islands in Spain Gary always laughs laughs at me um I was one of those that was on the streets handing out tickets and getting people into clubs and bars and um, and when I therefore joined Bupa and came into the corporate world Culture and I became shot. a, I, yeah, I became a team manager and uh, I just sort of looked at everybody else and they just all seemed better than me. They all seemed to know what they were doing. They had sort of had sensible jobs when they left school and they were well educated. And there was me kind of, what did I know coming in from, 
you know, the streets of Spain handing out tickets into this sort of corporate environment. Um, and that really that really stuck with me. And that stuck with me for a lot of my career. And I, I found myself comparing me to colleagues um, quite often. Um, so through my through my 30s, really struggled with that. Um, and that was when I was kind of sort of going up from STM to operations manager. I was finding myself in meetings with more senior people, which I hated. Um, I used to blush a lot, I used to sweat a lot. It's one of those hot, sweaty, blushing kind yeah. of people. They must have thought, you know, how on earth is uh, did she get this job? Um, and then, and then in my uh, so then in my thirties, and, and then I and then I had my daughter. So I had my daughter age thirty nine, which is probably sort of uh, um, sort of quite late, or it's quite the norm now, I guess. Um, but then as soon as I become a mum, I got a bit, I gained a bit of a different perspective. Actually, I suddenly realised that there were far more important things in life and 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 the world just become a, a just changed for me something happened whether it was my hormones but i'd like to think it was uh, so, so so something changed and i got a bit of perspective and um i think now where i'm at is i i can reference and think back to that moment in time um and the women's network is quite, was kind of born out of that in terms of of women who might be feeling similar in their 30s in that early part of their career that might be struggling I think you can struggle at any point in your career if you're perfect if I'm perfectly honest it's not that was just my experience in my 30s um so yeah I mean I think how do I sort of re remind myself I can very easily take myself back into that time and, and kind of compare myself to where I am kind of now um I'm much more confident in terms of speaking out about how that feels. Um, I will, I, I, I've taken it upon myself to educate people around me in terms of how it feels to, um, when you struggle with imposter syndrome, how it feels when you're not confident. I think sometimes just saying it out loud makes it less, yeah. less of a thing. Um, you know, so I'm really struggling. I don't feel very confident or I was in that meeting and this is how I felt or, you know, sometimes there are situations that you're in or the, the way that people talk around you that can actually mm. make you feel less confident. So, again, I think I would say, you know, being brave, um, calling things out if you see it where, uh, you know, I think inclus inclusivity is a, a kind of plays a big role in terms of that self-confidence and kind of imposter syndrome. Some of it's from within, some of it's externally kind of making you feel that way. So um, so I think, yeah, being being aware of it. And I think the other thing as well is, I don't know, um, kind of when I say this, most people kind of uh, say yes, but that self-talk and really tuning into your own self-talk. Um, I have become quite good at actually understanding and hearing that voice when it's in my head. Um, my voice has actually got a gender, so I have, which again might sound a bit weird and I'm not crazy, um, but, you know, tuning into that self-talk and, and again, reframing that self-talk when, you, when you've when you tuned into it. So, um, and then I've also, sorry, I'm get, talking a lot, Gary, but no, I've no, also, you, you're one, sharing a lot of uh, <laughs> really interesting nuggets, so I'll carry on. There was one, uh, there was one sort of final thing that I've learned to do, um, probably sort of a bit of a coaching technique, really was when situations are challenging and hard, asking yourself what that what that situation could be for in terms of what it's trying to teach you. So I think, you know, challenging situations is where we grow the most, right? So we can all, like, all look back on, you know, things that have happened in our lives or t times when our bosses have been quite difficult or challenging, um, which are hard at the time, but when you look back and reflect, you go, what did I learn? So I will quite often ask myself if I find I've got that self-doubt creeping in or lacking confidence or things are quite difficult, well, what could this be trying to teach me? And once I can answer that question, I can kind of then go, oh, okay, that's quite interesting and move forward, move forward yeah. with it. Um, and that's quite helpful. It's a bit of a coaching yeah. technique. but and, and I think there's a there's a really great phrase that I, I like that helps me challenge my thinking is, that, is there's no growth in comfort. So actually, if everything's hunky dory and nice you probably need to challenge yourself a little bit more and you probably need to stretch yourself just a little bit to kind of make yourself feel uncomfortable and i think it's about forcing your own self-development which is is something i want to talk about with you jake because i know how much of um a fan you are in in your own personal development and in your own growth and i, I want to touch on how important is that in your leadership style that you yeah. do that and how do you how do we support other leaders to invest in themselves more 
um, to help them grow. So, so talk to us about a little bit about your own personal growth um, and development story. Yeah. Okay. So from a so from a personal point of view, um, I um, so personal growth and development is really important to me. I always think that to be the best that you can for your teams, you constantly need to invest in yourself. So for me, continually um, taking stock of your own skills, your own. Um, you know, your own sort of strengths, I th you know, I think very much, you know, what are you good at, what you're not so good at, and how are you going to actually plug, plug the gaps in terms of the stuff that you're not good at, if it's important. Sometimes you cannot be good at stuff and it's not really, you know, I can't play football as an example, but I'm not going to spend my time learning football, right? So it's, me what's, you, what's, imp no what's important? Yeah, but what's important? What would make you the best that you could be for your team or for your boss, right? So what are the gaps that you've actually got and, and being really sort of self-aware? So I think that... um regular stock take in terms of your skills your competencies aligned with the things that you'll be inspected to deliver is really really important um i'm someone who, who does have a, a love of learning and i know when i'm learning and and kind of gaining new skills i'm interested in new things that i'm at my best um so um it's an example at the moment i'm studying um positive psychology as a as a course it's something i've always been interested in and actually that's helping me in the workplace as well um, and applying the skills that I'm learning from an external course into the into the workplace is, is kind of really helping. I think from a team perspective, um, and maybe kind of people might kind of resonate with this in if uh, sort of, particularly from a contact centre point of view. Um, when I, so I I make sure that anybody who joins my team, I go into um, training, I meet them, say hello, find out a bit about them, and I, I'll always ask them their career and um, aspirations, why they've joined the team that they have, and what they're looking for. Um, I'm going to say 99% of the time, people will tell me that they've joined Boopa because they want to grow, they want an opportunity, we're a big global brand. What they don't ever say to me is they've joined Boopa because they want to work in a contact centre and that is their career mm. ambition, right? So mm. people are looking for that growth and development. So, so for me as a leader, it's really important that we're actually fulfilling that need. We're not going to retain people if ultimately they join a company for career growth and progression and then that's that they don't get it so so that for me is really really important and I think it starts with starts with yourself so you've got to look at yourself and understanding your own growth and development to support um to support other people I think as leaders sometimes we feel guilty for taking time out for growth and development so yep, sure. you know how many times do you kind of go well, I'm too busy to go to that webinar I'm too busy to join that thing where they're talking about growth and development and actually when we're too busy to invest in our own growth and development then actually we're not developing ourselves to be the best that we can be so mm. I would urge always urge and talk to my team about that if they're not growing themselves then actually they're doing their teams no favors um, mm. because they're, they're then not kind of helping their team so I think everybody owns their own growth and development um, everybody should have their own Sort of growth and development plan or whatever you might call it um and i think it's about understanding what support and help people need in terms of their aspirations so if they have joined a team and they're looking to work in it in the future then what doors do we as leaders need to open up to them to enable that to happen who do we need to introduce them to so um so yeah, huge um, the growth and development is massively important for me and my team. Um, I've got a bit of a, um, I'm known for that. I'm famous for that internally. I have people knocking on my door asking me what I do um, for my own teams in terms of that space. Um, and I suppose it's, it's a great point, Jane. And, and not everybody is as forthcoming as, as yourself on, on driving that agenda. And it, and it does make me think it's who owns leadership development and and where does that kind of accountability sit is it for the leaders to drive growth in their leadership team and where does the the l d responsibility of that sit and how do we harmonize the two i suppose is the question because being a leader you, you've said it yourself you're constantly busy you're constantly being invited to meetings constantly having to think about the strategic direction and you don't always have time for that time to invest in in your leadership team so who owns the agenda? So I think as a leader in an organization, you know what's expected and the standards of your team. So I think in terms of who drives the agenda, the business has to drive the agenda. I think where L&D come in, I see them as the enablers and that the business is the customer. 
So therefore delivery of um, and closing the gap in terms of the skills, the competencies, whatever the, the um, you know, the thing is that needs closing, that for me is where L&D, um, you know, sort of come into play, if you like. That's how I see the relationship. We're their customer, L&D, L&D deliver. Um, I think it's quite interesting in terms of how L&D set more of the strategic ob objectives in terms of where we're going. So if we think about the, the way that the, the world is sort of changing in terms of digital, um, where we, it, autom automation, data scientists, data analytics, you know, we're all moving in that direction. And I think actually that's where L&D play a part in terms of future yeah. capabilities. So, um, you know, how do we get future fit? How do we get ready for what's coming? Because again, to your point within the business, you know, you're kind of sitting in that role where it's very much about delivering today for our customers. But as our businesses transform and change and our customer expectations change, how do we make sure that our business stays fit for that change that we're going to need to yeah. need to deliver? Are we future fit for five years out? If, if yeah. you like, for example, future proofing um, your, your your leadership and your leadership capability. Um, cause ultimately if, if we don't, it's just going to be the, the attrition door on leadership is going to be, it's going to start revolving even, even further. And I, and I think you, you talk about some, some, obviously I, I understand that the challenges that come with running a busy contact center and quite often that almost takes the priority over any development. And we, we lose the opportunity to create a, a learning development culture or a coaching culture because everything gets pulled and I know how busy your operation is sometimes um so what advice would you give to operational leaders who want to invest in leadership development who want to do all the right things for their their team to to get that access and to develop that capability but it's just balls to the wall calls are queuing everybody needs to be on the phone what's what's what what do leaders do in that scenario so I think this is where you've got to get smart, Gary, and you've got to get a bit creative in terms of the time that you've got. So, um, you know, I think as a, as a leader, so I think as a as a, a leader in an organisation, you've got to you've got to carve out the time, right? Because it's your responsibility for your own self development, and it's important. You've got to make the time. So it might be I'll give you, you know, it's lunchtime now. Who's grabbed a cuppa and a sandwich and is actually taking the opportunity to sit down and to listen to conversations such as this one, as an example. Um, uh, prior to coming on this call, there was um, a CCMA a webinar around employee well-being and a study that they've done. You know, I grabbed a sandwich and a cup of tea, just tuned into that. So I think as leaders, it's our responsibility to keep up to date and keep on top of, um, uh, you know, kind of our own self-development and our own self-growth. And, you know, I would I would challenge anybody who says I can't carve, carve out an hour a month to actually invest in me, my knowledge, my own self-development. I think when it gets to our frontline colleagues, yes, it does become more challenging because obviously they're the, you know, facing into the customer and we need to work out how we give them the same opportunities. Um, I think it's then you get smart in terms of looking at the, where the opportunities are with what's already in plan. So you know, do you get creative with your monthly one-to-ones as example? And I would hope nobody cancels a monthly one-to-one -one, um, because that they, those for me are you know, sacrosanct in the operation and it's a really, you know, you, you, don't, you just, that time is protected. But, you know, do use that time as an opportunity to do some development together, as an example. You know, let's watch this web, you know, watch this webinar. It was really good. Let's watch that together. You know, as part, yeah. let's reflect on it. Let's talk about it. What have you learned? How can you use those skills? So I think there are opportunities, but you might just need to think a little bit differently. Um, I think things like lunch and learns are a really good example of um, an opportunity where you can, you know, and I'm not I'm not encouraging people to sit glued to a screen during their lunch break. But as an organisation, if you if you can run bite sized lunch and learns, particularly around career development, you know how to write a great PDP, mm. a 35 minute bite sized session. Somebody can still have their lunch or take a walk either side of that if they get an hour for lunch. Um, but actually kind of dropping in those bite sized sessions where people can um, just kind of learn quick things. What somebody in my team who, and again, I don't do TikTok, right? I think I'm too old, but, um, you know, is always on TikTok, but picks up Excel skills as an example. So she'll share the sort of two minutes on how to do a pivot table in Excel, right? So quite basic, um, but actually really quite useful for a team leader. And she'll drop that into our team's chat. So again, that opportunity to 
do small things that don't take up loads of time but are creative in terms of the means and and ways of kind of sharing knowledge and picking up people picking up different skills I don't know things like using team meetings and actually Mm. in a team meeting asking somebody to research a topic or go and visit another team and bring that back into a team meeting and share that you know that gives them development of running a team meeting finding out something else about another team so I think for frontline colleagues it's really easy to say we we can't do it and we haven't got time I think that's lazy and I think it's a cop-out I think it's our responsibility as leaders to make to make the time you know and our frontline colleagues growth and development is is just as if not more important than mm. the nows if you like i i think you make some really good points there i want to see an opportunity for anybody who's got any burning questions to uh fire them at james so if you have got a question um please either either drop into the chat and i can ask it for you or just um take yourself off, off mute and interrupt me at any point and we'll fire uh, a question across to jane but before we do that sarah i'm gonna just pick up on a, a comment that you've made in the chat. So this is going to give you an opportunity to compose yourself for a second. Um, and I know you run um, y- your own center, Sarah, through uh, We Answer, and you've talked about in the chat there about the importance of uh, role modeling, a growth mindset and attitude uh, within the, the center. And, and, and as one operational leader to another, I'm just going to ask you, how do you do that? How do you get your team to, to role model um, that 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 mindset, that right growth mindset in in your um, in your operation. Putting you on the spot, I know. So apologies. No, it's, but, uh, it's, I think it's, it's fine. A it's, it's fine. I think quite simply, it starts with you. So it definitely starts with the leader of the centre, because by role modelling yourself, that growth mindset development opportunities are really important. You're giving your team permission to do the same with themselves and with their team. So, Jane, I loved your comment then about the using team meetings for development. I do a senior team meeting every Tuesday and without fail, I'll show a TED talk or I, I watched a webinar the other day that had some really great stuff about hybrid working and how we can make things better for our colleagues and how we can develop them. So I will always bring something like that to the meeting because actually as important it is that we think strategically, if we're not growing as leaders and we're not developing our people, then actually it will be very difficult to get to where we need to get to. So, so for me, it, that role modeling piece is so key because people look to us to see how to behave. You know, how often have you heard someone say the boss is in a bad mood, so it's going to be a really bad day today? Yeah. Um, I'd like to think nobody says that about me in the center. Um, but actually, it's, it, it is. It's key. They, they look to us for permission on, on what we do and how we do things around here. Um, yeah. We're not great at the senior management training and development, if I'm honest. So we, we've nailed it with team leaders in terms of getting a development program out with subs on the bench. But actually, we've still got a step change to do in terms of those more senior roles. Uh, yeah. We've used ILM level three and level five as, as a bit of a stopgap for us at the moment while we create things. Um, and I think it's also really important that the leadership team has a really strategic and aligned relationship with the learning and development element in the organizations because actually our, our our strategies and action plans should should all match they should mirror you know in line with the hr as well so but yeah for me i know i've rambled on and probably crossed over lots of different bits there but it, it's about if, if i do it then i'm giving permission to everyone else to do it because actually that's that's just what we do in the center it's that cultural piece yeah i, I think you you've, you've mentioned a, re- a really great point there sarah around use of courses and external accreditations like ILM and Jane you've talked about apprenticeships but you also when you, when you were talking Jane you were talking about how we failed to hit the mark on embedding that um so what do we need to change because actually ILM courses apprenticeships they all cost money they all cost budget um so not following through on those is is 100% a waste of money so from from your point of view Jane thinking about what contact centers need to do to I suppose inspect what you expect and build that observational framework which gives people the rubber stamp to say we've seen you put these principles into practice what do we need to change and, and why doesn't that happen now I suppose is, is probably the other question so I think um so I think apprenticeships are oh so it's so again I've talked from my own experience so in our organization, our apprenticeships are owned by our apprenticeship team who sit over there. So um, 
and they're not they don't feel like they're owned kind of within the business so I, I, I'm kind of sitting here thinking if you were to ask me who's on my team as apprenticeship right now I, I, I probably wouldn't know and that sounds awful to actually say that because I should know and I should be actually planning for when their apprenticeships finish and they can use those use those um, skills so I think that's the first thing is we're just not joined up enough with the kind of apprenticeship team um probably not bought in enough to what the apprenticeship is delivering and kind of giving and and I think that kind of if we could there, there could be more alignment between the teams that are managing the apprenticeships and the business yeah. to actually then kind of build in that follow-up program as an example mm. um one of the things that we've done Gary just to kind of bridge the bridge the gap um we actually run what we call academies within my team. So we have a number of academies. We have a deputy um, manager academy, we have a coaching academy, and that's something that we run within and from our own team. So they're designed by the business, they're run by the business, um, and actually were developed by one of our coaches who spotted a gap in terms of what would have helped them as an aspiring coach to move into that position. Our academies are six month programs where the teams who apply for them and are successful go through a series of modules of learning, a bit like the apprentice, but more locally apprenticeships, but more locally owned. Yeah. Um, and part of that includes observations, running, you know, running the skills that they're actually yeah. learning with that kind of mentor and a support kind of within the within the team. Um, and they've worked, they've worked really, really well. And that's something actually, because that's kind of been created and owned within my team, something that we're trying to push out to the wider business. But again, I think from an L&D point of view, it'd be great if that's that sort of central in our L&D team, they were run twice a year where people could apply, a bit like the apprenticeships are, but it's mm. that next kind of level, level down of, um, you know, they're not high level, they're actually learning the skills to do the job. So not just the theory, um, you know, and not just the kind of role playing, but they're actually learning the kind of skills on the job by kind yeah. of do, doing that within the There's, a, there's, a, there's a danger, isn't there, that you, you learn all these great skills and then you revert to type because nobody's actually giving you the feedback to say that you've observed it and you're doing a great job or tweak one of these one or two things to make it land better, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, 100%, you know, you're only as good as kind of the feedback that you get. And the feedback might be, you know, the observation, that's brilliant, there's nothing to improve. But actually, that kind of regular learning cycle, uh, you know, if, if we all think and adopt the mindset that we could all do something better, or, or be better, you know, that's the mindset that I kind of operate in, you know, I, I think never, never stand still and always kind of think that you could, or, or, or ask yourself, what could I do? What could I do better? What could I do differently? I think these there's an interesting dynamic with with leadership now in the in the world that we're in um and we've gone from probably three years ago where all leaders were in the office with the teams managing as a team together and kind of having sideways conversations where you're just going up to people and checking in and how they are versus now either 100 percent remote or 100 uh, percent or, or a mixture of remote and hybrid and um, how would you say leadership qualities have changed in your view as a result of COVID and as a result of that operational change? Has it made it harder, easier? And, and how are you finding it within, within your operation? Oh, God. I mean, hybrid's another a whole different world, isn't it, when you think about kind of that and how that's changed? Um, I think, yeah, it, it, it's definitely changed how we operate. Um, I think the expectations of our staff have changed in terms of kind of what they expect from the leadership. And I do think that staff have become more demanding in terms of um, what they expect from organisations. So, um, you know, we have teams who you know don't want to be in the office and, and don't, you know, they, they just don't want to come in. That, that's it. They don't want to. Um, and they're not going to. Right. That's that's their starting point. So, um you know, it's a bit like, well, how do you create an environment where people want to? So that's kind of step one. Um, so you kind of do everything that you can that creates that environment that makes people want to be in the workplace and see the benefits. But when you really got somebody who's going, no, I'm just not coming in. You know, where, where do you go with that? Do you go down the route of, well, actually, I'm telling you, you have to and, there, and therefore you do. And, you know, I tell you, you do. And that's what you have to do. And, you know, that's that's kind of the worst place for us to be. But I think um, where my head is at in terms of what's right with we're not kind of necessarily talking about hybrid, but I think as you know, links to leadership is we have to think about what's right for our customers. Um, 
And I think if we start to think about what's right for customers, and that's our first question that we ask ourselves, I think the rest becomes quite, quite easy. Um, and I think that is about, you know, we look at productivity and understand actually, are we delivering the service that we should be working in the way that we are? Mm. And if you can answer that question and, and the answer is yes, then nothing needs to, to change. Or actually, if we're saying we're less effective now um, for our customers and we're not delivering the service that we were pre-COVID, then actually, actually, what is it that needs to that needs to change? And that might be because leadership is harder. I, I, that's my personal opinion. I think it's more difficult to lead from it's more difficult to lead from home. People are less visible. You know, for yeah. me, I've had um, lots of new recruits join over the last sort of three years. Um, I used to pride myself on the fact that I knew every single name of the 120 people that worked in my team. I go into the office now. I don't. Um, you know, and that's something I just think, oh, you know, I need to be better because I should know the names of everybody that works right. in my team. That becomes much more difficult. And um, I think there's also something about employee well-being. So how do you know how somebody is if you can't see them? How do you read that body language if they've had a, mm. an argument at home and they're, they're coming into work? What if they never turn their camera off? So I think um, I think, yes, leadership is harder. Personally, I think we've lost something, you know, in terms of and, and I know there's loads of different opinions on hybrid. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I I sit on the fence and I can see, you know, I look at kind of both sides. But when I think what's right for our customers and right for our business, because ultimately we're running a business, right? Our customers pay yeah. our wages and we need customers to, to you yeah. know, to keep our business going. And I think that has to be the start point. And I think that's yeah. the shift that and organizations do you, do you think there need is, to make. Um... We, we talked about this in a, in a, a webinar recently around a, a bias towards employees from leaders that are in the office versus ones that are more remote. Do you, do you believe that there is a, a bias in there? I think there has to be. I think naturally the people that you see more are more in your thoughts and therefore that it takes no effort to, for them to be in there. Um, yeah. Whereas the people that you don't see as a leader how do you how do you remember them you know how do they not just become particularly not necessarily for that team leader because for a team leader a team leader has a team to lead and they will be interacting on teams and whatsapp and chats mm. and uh, in their one-to-ones but i definitely think for our operational leaders and definitely for me one removed from the operational leaders um you know i've got people that i haven't i, I was in the office last week i saw somebody i hadn't seen for two years um but they haven't been in my mind over the last two years. I wouldn't have even thought of them for an opportunity to work on a project that I know yeah. we need support on. So I think, yeah, there is a real um, there is a real danger that we could quite easily slip into not being inclusive in terms of opportunities for all, um, and start to create a two tier a two tier working environment where when you're in the office, you're the one that's get, that you get, that's going to get the opportunities. Um, and I think that is a real danger to And if you were to offer advice to, to other leaders from your experience of kind of managing that transition from in, out to, to more hybrid, what would be some of your perhaps learns or some, some tips to, to try and nail that? I would say probably my biggest learn and biggest reflection is be decisive. Um, in terms of of what the expectations are on your teams. So I think um, we have kind of not really decided on what we want our teams to do and therefore they've had the choice and therefore they've not necessarily chosen in the way that, that we've wanted them to necessarily. Um, I think ultimately as a leader of a team, you set the tone, you set the culture. So again, mm. I go back to, is the way that you're working right for your customers? Yeah. So that's 100%. question one, that would be my first thing. The second thing is, is the way that you're working creating the culture that you're looking for? Um, and again, you know, ask yourself those. So, so I think for me, mm. I would question your business objectives, your vision, your strategy, and actually does your way of working align to what you're trying to create and the and the answer to that might be different by different teams by different organizations by different cultures yeah. different businesses um I, I, we're, we're kind of in the midst of all of that thinking at the moment gary and it's really hard like really it's hard because you want to you want to do right by your teams right well but, I but mean, ultimately you've got to do right culture, by your customers creating that culture for your teams and for your customers can't be an easy thing. If it was easy, we'd have all nailed it. So 
I think it takes a lot of thought. It takes a lot of reinvention and transformation of your processes, your ways of working, your, your interactions. Um, and I, I can't think of many people that have got it solid yet. So I don't, I don't think you're alone in, in going on that journey. Um, and even those who are 100% home working, I don't necessarily think I've got it 100% nailed either. Um, so I think, I, I, I think you've shared some really, really valuable stuff there, Jane. And thank you for being so um, honest and open with your, your own experiences um, and advice and suggestions for others. I, I could talk to you, as you know, all day, but we have only got uh, an hour for this. And I think that's been a really useful session, both to get to know you more personally as well, but also to share some of your experiences on how you manage, how you lead and, and kind of help bridge some of that gap because it's not easy, especially in the current environment, especially with the current operating model and the, the economic environment because that's driving demand. It's driving vulnerability in customers. It's driving vulnerability in our frontline teams and our leadership team at the same time. So we're in a, we're in a, we're in a hot mess um, it's good to know um, that it's that there is a way through it, um, but it, it will take time and it is a, an evolution. But um, all that remains to be said is thank you very much to my guest, Jane. Thanks very much for Sarah for um, being, being an impromptu panelist for a second. Hopefully that's been really useful for everybody. Um, and we'll save this down as a recording. And we'll share it after um, so that anybody that didn't get an opportunity to listen um, gets an opportunity to reflect back. And if you did like it, and you thought Jane was awesome, which I think she is, feel free to comment on social media as to how you found this session. So other people flock to these types of sessions and um, share in the value. So I'm going to ask Jane just to stay for 60 seconds while I, I let everybody else leave. But thank you very much. And tune in to the next one, which will be in the last Thursday of February. So see you all then. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks, Bye. everybody.